Yeah, so I was given six questions to answer, and that's a lot of their big questions, and um, I have 15 minutes. So I'm going to talk fast. So this is a little kind of summary of my path. Luxor is my most recent company, and it really draws upon all of the experiences that I've had. And it's, I say 15 years in Silicon Valley, but the truth is that it's more like 20. Um, for five years, I was an editor of a video games magazine. And while that's not web stuff, it does count as being in Silicon Valley. So, but it makes me feel younger to say 15 years. Um, Adaptive Path is now 12 years old. It's internationally famous in its industry. It's one of the leading companies. And Netscape, at the time that I was there, was the fastest growing startup in history. It was kind of like the Facebook of its time. When I started at Netscape, there were two buildings. I was employee 750. And when I left, 14 months later, there were 35 buildings. 35. So it was quite an adventure. Um, I'm also currently an advisor to a, a number of startups. In, and these are some of, my, some of the companies that I advise. Um, please feel free to follow me on Twitter. Um, Clever Girl is my name pretty much everywhere on the web. Um, I've been Clever Girl since 1997, so be careful. I'm going to be 85 years old with dangly arms, and I'm still going to be Clever Girl. So choose your usernames wisely. That's my advice to you. Um, so one of the questions that I was asked to answer was, what do I do in my spare time? I'm an entrepreneur, and entrepreneurs do work, and we're kind of consumed by our work. And that's true, but the truth is that we also have lives. Um, and this has been my life for the last 10 years. I got pregnant uh, three months after starting Adaptive Path. My husband and I had just moved into a house, and there you go. And you start a company, and then you have a family. So that was him a long time ago, and, and that's him last summer. He's now 10. And, uh, I would, rather, I would rather hang out with my kid than go to Paris. Like, I just, I can't tell you like that. So for me, that's right now what my life is like. Before that, I did other things. I had a social life. I also had no idea that I was going to do this, but I started the PTA at his elementary school when he went into kindergarten. And I'll tell you, that was much harder than starting a company. Um, yeah. I'm also an artist, not a very good one, but I, it is how I keep my feet on the ground. Um, I will lose myself in artwork. I paint and I do collage and, you know. So that's how I spend my time. Um, I was asked to tell a little bit of the story of how I ended up in technology. I was an English major um, in college, uh, but only for my senior year of college. Before that, I really, really wanted to be in biotechnology. I thought, you know, DNA was it. Uh, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. This was a very long time ago. This was 19, I went to college in 1984. So um, probably before your parents were born. Um, so in a very few slides, here is the story of my professional life. I went to college and I thought, hey, DNA is really cool and you can do stuff with it. You can break it apart and recombine it and I can make a career out of that. And then, uh-oh, I had junior year. I got a great internship in a lab and I absolutely hated the work. I, like, I hated it. I loved the science. I hated the work. So oops. Um, so I finished my degree in English because I could. Uh, it didn't add a lot of time to leave the college that I was in and end up in the English department. So I, I finally graduated. Whee! And you'd think, you know, the well-planned career over here or me. I took the only job that was offered to me. Um, I got paid $19,000 a year, and I lived in rural Ohio at a small bank. And it turned out I was a really lousy banker. Yeah, not a good fit. So a year later, I, um, a year later, I followed my boyfriend to New Hampshire. Because you know, who doesn't want to go from Ohio to New Hampshire? <laughs> so um, it turned out that was not necessarily a bad idea because I got really, really lucky. And you want to know how I got lucky? My fiance's coworker was fired for sexual harassment, and I took his job. <laughs> <clears throat> so it was a copy, no, it was actually a proofreader position. Like, I actually had to proofread 
computer code because it was a computer hobby magazine because that's all you can get in New Hampshire. So I had to proofread the code that was going into the magazine that then some hobbyist would then type into their computer and run a program. It was mind-numbing work. I was actually not very good at that either, so they promoted me. <laughs> um, but it turned out that being in publishing was a great fit. I had a fantastic career there. Um, I got to start a new magazine. This was right about the time Wired was started, and we launched a competing magazine. And while that one didn't go, it was exciting to do something new. And that's where I can start to see the origins of my entrepreneurial zeal. Um, but I found my passion. I found my drive completely accidentally. I want to emphasize that none of this was well planned. All of this was just being open to opportunity and saying yes. Um, I found my way into high tech. Who knew that an English major would end up in high tech? I have no idea. Like I, I would never have chosen that. But I was really, really lucky. Um, I, uh, again, I was very lucky because I was on a list to be laid off. Um, my magazine was dying, and I was number 30 on a list of 30 people who were going to get laid off. And uh, so there you go. But it turned out, you'd think it was a bad thing, but it turned out to be really, really lucky because my husband got a job offer to go to San Francisco from New Hampshire, and we said yes. So we like, OK. Like literally, he got a job offer like December 2nd, and we were here with all of our possessions uh, by Christmas Eve. So, and I had never been west of the Mississippi River, and it is a big freaking country. So I just said, you know, I don't have to live in New Hampshire. I can get in a car and go over there. We had no apartment. I didn't have a job. I just believed that I could figure it out because I'm that person. Um, so he gets a job offer. Um, that was luck plus plans. We, we were looking for opportunities in Boston and San Francisco. So there was a little bit of planning there. So I can start to feel like I'm taking a little more control over my life. I ended up getting a job offer from a magazine here in video games. And that's how I ended up starting my career in Silicon Valley. Um, it was awesome. I, I doubled my salary instantly. Like It was a fantastic opportunity. I got to start things. It was impressive. Um, I did really well, and about three years in to that opportunity, my boss got promoted away, my new boss came in, and he hated me, and he gave me a terrible evaluation. Like, just pulled the rug out from under me. I thought I was doing a great job. I had had all fives on a scale of one to five every year until this guy came in, and then I was twos. And if you ever had a two, if you ever get a two on an evaluation, you're like, oh my god, I'm really awful. I should just die now. Um, and it turned out that that is yet another negative that turned out to be a really good thing for me because I had to figure out what to do. So I, I was over the Christmas holiday, I contacted some friends, um, some women actually, who were in my book club. And one of them was in HR and I was like, well, what do I do? I got this terrible evaluation and she's like, I don't know, what do you want your life to be? And I got really strong. And I wrote a rebuttal to my evaluation. I uh, got myself made an, uh, an assistant to the webmaster, the web was brand new then. I, so I turned this negative into this tremendous opportunity. I learned HTML, and I called a friend of mine who had gotten the job as uh, editor-in-chief of the Netscape website. And I arranged for my own layoff. So I got hired at what was then the hottest startup in history. Um, I started at Netscape in January of 1996. Um, I already told you about the going from two buildings to 35 buildings. It was such a profound shift for me. I was finally working with people who wanted to reinvent the future. Now, at this point, I'm 30 years old. So you guys are probably, I don't know, 15, 16, 17, I don't know, something. I was twice your age when I found myself in the situation you're in now. You're surrounded by people who are interested in changing the world by reinventing what is possible. And that is, that's the hope of the future, right? You have in your hands the ability to reinvent the world through whatever startups you invent yourself. It took me a long time to find my way there, but I did, and I'm grateful. So again, woohoo, huge pay increase, awesome. I felt lucky, lucky, lucky. I was surrounded by brilliant people. I found my way to a new career. I shifted from magazine editing, which was fine, to the internet, and the internet was new, 
and amazing, and I knew that I wanted to be part of it forever. So after a year in Summit Netscape, I had to figure out, do I want to stay, get a different job? You know, it was kind of time to move on. So I took a big risk. I quit my job to become an independent consultant, which is actually done really frequently now. But at the time, I only knew two or three people who had ever been an independent consultant. And so for me, it felt like jumping off a cliff. And hey, look, this is me flying, not falling. I jumped off the cliff and I found out I can actually do this really well. So I took this big risk and it paid off. And one of my clients said, hey, let's start a company together. So I was like, sure, OK. And we got sort of acquired. And it was a terrible, terrible deal. And I got burned. And I called my attorney. But then I moved on. And awesome. The next thing I did was start Adaptive Path. So I have had this series of like crazy difficulties and shifts in strategy and shifts in career. And yet, every time, a new door opened. You know, they say, you, you know, close a door, a window opens. Well, it really was more like, you know, I'd close a window and, you know, some big, huge, grand door would open and invite me in and give me a tiara, right? So what I want to share with you, if there's one point, it's to follow your gut about who you are as a person and what makes you thrilled to be doing it. What gets your brain fired up? And pursue that. And that's how I ended up in technology. And this is what I believe in. What's most important is that you be yourself. Um, I think that you should work at the edge of your ability. Really push yourself, and that's what you're here doing tonight. And I think that's fantastic. I love the work. I live in this world, not because I'm making big fat bank, because I'll tell you, entrepreneurship is not the easy path to get rich. If you want an easy path to get rich, go work on Wall Street. This is an easy path to work really hard and make some money occasionally. So this is who I am. I really like it. Um, and I hope that that gives you some framework for imagining what a future could be like for yourself. So that's the answer to some of my questions. So first, what's my personal story in starting Luxor? Um, two of my investor friends asked me on the same day to make a design program for their startups. I went, OK, I can do that. I'm not doing anything else interesting right now. So I did that, and it's turned into a really, really successful company. Um, we launched a new product a few weeks ago, and I've already sold $10,000 worth of units which I had no idea would happen. So like it turns out, after 18 months, we're an overnight success. Um, what do I like to do outside of work? I hang out with my kid. I start the PTA, which blows my mind still. Um, what was my path to career in technology? You've just seen. Why do I think it is great to be a woman entrepreneur in the tech industry? Well, here's the thing. I think it's great to be an entrepreneur in the tech industry. The fact that you're a woman is incidental to that. It might sometimes feel uncomfortable to be the only girl in the room, but you know what? That really doesn't matter because you are up to the challenge. right? So I think being a woman in technology is exciting and fulfilling, and it allows you to kind of live out your values and make the world what you want it to be. So you know, I think technology innovation is there's no other career I could imagine having at this point. I, would, I, I can tell you quite honestly, I would do it even if I wasn't getting paid. And you know how I know that? Because I haven't gotten paid in six months. So there you go. Um, how big is the opportunity for mobile apps? Uh, well, as, as big as the universe. Like There is no limit, I think. It is burgeoning. It will continue to be huge. Mobile is, you know, like desktop computing is, you know, fine, all well and good. Billions of dollars will be made in companies doing desktop computing, but mobile is new. It's still evolving rapidly. We have no idea where it's going to end up. So it's a limitless opportunity space right now. So that's my answer to that. And finally, number six, I have one minute left. How do you know that you have a product that your users will buy? Oh my God, this is such a good question. This is the good question for any um, early entrepreneur. And the answer lies in a uh, 
method called customer development. And I don't know if this is something you go over, but it, you, will go. you will go over. So you will learn the answer to that question. What customer development says is that you get to know the people you're making your application for. You find out what their life is like, what their needs are, what their goals are. And you begin to imagine how your product vision can help them to have that set of goals and needs met. So your value proposition, so they, it's one of the things that you put in a pitch deck, your value proposition. So the value proposition is the intersection of a real person's real needs and goals and your vision for business. And finding that intersection is the core of customer development. So what you, that's a lot of jargon, but basically what you need to do is understand a, a person who you want to make a product for by interviewing them with open-ended questions. You learn about them, and then you imagine the kind of thing that would help them solve whatever that problem is or take advantage of whatever opportunity is in front of them. So product market fit and pivots and all of that is just a bunch of startup jargon. What it just really means is understand people, make something they need and want, and then they will love to buy it. So I think I did it perfectly in time. Good? Thank you. So why don't Back we to you. take some questions for Dennis? Any questions? Yes. What is Luxor? Oh, that's a great question. I forgot to answer that one. Because it wasn't on my list of six questions. So um, Luxor stands for the Lean User Experience Residency. It started as a 10-week program. I would have five companies come to my studio one day a week for coaching as they develop their product. The teams would pay $13,000 for this. Um, and we have five teams together. So we start one on Friday. We have a residency beginning on Friday. And they just come and get a lot of coaching and a lot of methodology about how to do product development. Um, we, what we've now launched is a series of lessons in a box. Um, so we're taking everything we've learned from the residencies and making it available in a broadly distributable format so that anyone anywhere in the world at a much lower price can purchase a lesson or a set of lessons about how to make your startup. So that's what Luxor is. Yes? Was there ever a point in my career when I felt like giving up? I can't tell you how many days I felt like giving up. You know, I, uh, yeah, it's a very, very hard thing that we're doing. Every honest entrepreneur will someday feel like, how do I keep going? Nothing I'm doing is working. I, you know, I should just go get, like, it's always, I should just go get a job. That's always, like, I should just go get a job. Then I could pay my mortgage. It'd be fine. Um, but I have a great husband, and I have great friends. I, I can't tell you, the network of people who are doing this are so kind and generous with their time and their love. And so, you know, I go have coffee with someone, or I, I meet a friend for a drink, and I complain about whatever's going wrong. You know, and I, I once raised a lot of, I raised a lot of uh, seed money for a company that I started in 2007. I raised $800,000 from some of the best people on the planet, um, Mitch Kapoor being one of them. Some of you, somebody here I was talking about, uh, Mitch Kapoor. And I lost all their money, gone. I laid off everybody. I loved this product. I loved, these, were, these people meant so much to me, and I let them all down. And that's what it's like to be the CEO of a company. You bear that responsibility and that burden. And you know what? Everyone understood. Everyone, including my investors, they know the risk they're taking better than I did. And I, it felt horrible. But you get up, and you're like, all right, well, that didn't work. OK, let's try something else. And it was in the aftermath of that that it was Mitch Kapoor who approached me and one other investor to start a design program for their companies. So out of, out of the bad things that happen, something wonderful happens in turn. So that was like the window closed. I was sad. You know, I, <laughs> I, I licked my wounds. And then a wonderful opportunity opened up for me. So yeah, 
It's not an easy life. So, yes, another question. Will I ever change into a new career? No. There's just, I, I work, I work six blocks from my home in this really kooky studio. I bring my dog to work with me. My partner is my husband. Um, my other par business partner is a dear, dear friend who I've known for 12 years and like I feel incomplete when she's not working with me. I get to work with the most innovative people literally on the planet. Like I can't imagine doing anything else at, at all. And I, I've considered getting a job like because the money would be a lot better. But the only reason I would consider getting a job is because the money's a lot better. I would rather be broke in a startup reinventing the world than anything else. So I'm a little idealistic, it turns out. <laughs> <laughs>